A very good morning, good afternoon, good evening to our viewers who have joined from different parts of the world. And welcome to this fourth session of APCR SHR 10 Virtual, the ongoing virtual series of the 10th Asia Pacific Conference on Reproductive and Sexual Health and Rights. Co-hosted by APCR SHR 10, Reproductive Health Association of Cambodia and CNS, this virtual conference features 14 online thematic sessions spread over June to December 2020, as all of you must be knowing. And we have plenary speakers and top ranking abstract presenters in each of the sessions, sharing their insights around sexual and reproductive health and rights and SDGs in the Asia Pacific Regional Conference. Today's session, which is the fourth in the series, as I mentioned earlier, focuses on young people and SRHR in Asia Pacific. Now I hand over the mic to our chairperson, Hadrian Fritz, or Heidi as we call her. Uh, she is technical analyst on youth and adolescents at the Asia and the Pacific Regional Office of the United Nations Population Fund, or UNFPA. Her work focuses on youth empowerment, advocacy, and youth policy in Asia and the Pacific. She uses data and evidence to advocate for the development, implementation, and scale up of targeted programs and policies that promote sexual and reproductive health and rights of adolescents and youth, including in humanitarian and peace building settings. Over to you, Heidi. Thank you very much, Shobha. I hope you can hear me. A warm welcome to all of you joining today's session, the fourth virtual session of the Asia Pacific Conference on Reproductive and Sexual Health and Rights 10 in the lead up to International AU Stay 2020. My name is Heidrun Fritz and I will be today's session chair. Titled Young People and SRHR in the Asia Pacific, this session will look at diverse harmful practices, social cultural norms, gender inequality and injustice. Youth bring a heightened need for comprehensive sexuality education, accessible and high quality services as an enabling and enabling policy, legislative and community environment to support a healthy transition into adulthood. Investments in SRH during this life stage bring a triple dividend of benefits, presenting a unique window in which to address norms, behaviors, and risk that are not only important for the health development and rights of that young person, but also for SRH across a life course and for the health and rights for the next generation. 2020, as we all know, is proving to be a difficult life-changing year. The COVID-19 virus has exposed deep inequalities in income, access to basic services and social protection for young people. Young people's access to sexual reproductive health services is even more limited, as it was discussed in the 9th APCRSRH 10 dialogue, which focuses on the issues related to the coronavirus and young people in Asia Pacific region in May 2020. On the 12th of August this year, the world will celebrate International Youth Day, a day for you, a day for me, a day for the nearly 1 billion young people aged 14 to 24 in, in the Asia Pacific region. Decades of experience and research show the bottom-up grassroots approaches are better to bringing change because communities themselves are best suited to change themselves. Young people are some of the most effective advocates for their own rights when given the chance to express themselves and to know and learn about their rights. The SDGs, the UN 2030 Youth Strategy, as well as the UNFPA Youth Strategy can give a framework but what's important is engagement, participation, and advocacy. This year's theme of International Youth Day, Youth Engagement for Global Action, seeks to highlight the ways in which engagement of young people at the local level is enriching national and multilateral institutions and processes. This pandemic also shows that there are many young people rising up to the extreme challenges, and the 12th August is there to celebrate this. And this is also what today's session is all about. Our guests share so much in common, a determination to change minds, show young persons 
enormous potential for activism and transform entire communities and societies with their research and programs. So let us now get to know our panelists and speakers and learn from their research. Please remember to submit questions in the chat if you, if you have some. And without further ado, it's my real honor to introduce our plenary speaker. Mr. Wu Changdeng is the vice chair of Youth Lead, the largest network of young key populations in Asia and the Pacific. Youth Lead works with young um, young key population and young people aged 14 to 25 who are either directly affected by HIV or at risk of an HIV infection. Youth Lead fights against discrimination and ensures young people's human rights are respected and young people are empowered to speak up. And without further ado, Mr. Wu Dang, this is yours. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Um, so hello everyone, hello young people and less young people. My name is Wu Zhengzhong again, I'm from Vietnam. And uh, it's just my great honor today to represent um, Youth Lead um, to um, uh, talk and discuss with you in, uh, about uh, the issue of young population in Asia Pacific. And um, also in, this, uh, in my presentations, I also use some of the inputs uh, uh, through the data um, uh, from my country where I came, uh, through uh, the ne network of uh, Vietnam, network of young key population as well. So thank you those organizations to help me, support me to develop this one. And uh, my presentation again, uh, it's uh, talking about the sexual and re reproductive health rights in young key population in Asia Pacific. and. Uh, you know, uh, when we're talking about, yeah, when we're talking about the young people, we, um, uh, you, you guys can see that uh, uh, the first images in our brains, it uh, looks similar to the pictures on your screen right now. Uh, we, uh, we thought about um, the young people, young students uh, sitting in the classes, uh, learning the lessons from the uh, teachers. And when they get home, uh, once again, the parents is the one to talk the, uh, to tell them uh, what is the right things uh, to learn and what is the right thing to do. Uh, however, the actually is um, um, uh, the fact is the education program, our education program right now, uh, it was designed and developed for uh, people, uh, for students, um, generally from different level, different area, different classes, um, in different uh, contexts and situations. So that's why um, uh, we, we think that we need something new to focus on the um, reliability. Um, so next slide, please. Um, and we have the teen gen programs, uh, um, as you can see here, uh, that is one of our programs uh, to, uh, we try to approach to the adolescents um, uh, in, uh, through, our, uh, through the, uh, across the Asia Pacific uh, to raise the awareness of them through many activities um, as in the format of the games, the role playing, practicing, competition, etc. And we target, uh, our target is the adolescent, but in, also in some country, we also want to challenge ourselves by uh, bring this kind of format to the schools, working with the school, because uh, we all know that working in the school um, so far is never easy, never been easy. Um, uh, and uh, besides, um, apart from that, we also have the other tool uh, with the name uh, uh, sex, Safe sex in youth uh, in the next slide. Um, and uh, safe sex in youth, we focus on the uh, a little bit older uh, young people. Uh, that's uh, the next slide, next slide, please, Bobby. Um, uh, yeah, this is the programs, one of the two we working with at the school, um, the student in the university. Uh, and we interact. Uh, we focus on the interaction between the students and the guests and also um, the teachers to find out the misunderstanding of the uh, students. Because um, most of us, 
we think about the students in university and colleges are the ones who are very open-minded and very modern-minded um, to the sexual and reproductive um, issues. But, you know, um, through this kind of series of workshop, we've, um, w most of them, when they're talking about the safe sex, um, they think they, they thought it's all, almost it's just uh, how to have sex without the pregnancy. So I, we found out, okay, so as the result, we, we recognize that there's a lot of things we have, we still have to do to educate um, this, this kind of groups. And yeah, the next slide, please. Yeah. Um, and uh, yes, through those kind of, uh, those two the tools, uh, we have many findings, as you can see in the uh, right columns uh, of the slides, uh, that the youth and adolescents, they have a super high demand to learn about the HRH, but they lack a lot of uh, the space, safe space and the right resource to gain the information. So we all, the, through that, we recommend that we should recognize uh, the uh, okay. something like... Okay, uh, should I continue? Yeah, uh, the, the, uh, should organize um, the, 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 uh, some kind of the services like the mental counseling um, in, in um, uh, the school, um, make them available for the student to assess when they need it. Um, uh, and um, beside of that, uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding uh, now it's available among the young, young people about HRHR. Uh, so how we should, uh, how we can providing the more exact information is really important to them. Uh, current programs in every school, uh, um, in, I mean in both the high, uh, the high schools um, and also the university and colleges are quite backward, quite out of it. Um, so we need the innovations um, for such kind of the uh, comprehensive uh, HRH programs uh, to educate every, um, our young people, the, the young generations. Um, through Teen Gen specifically, we found out uh, parents and teachers, they are the key factors to affect our, our youth so how we can en engage them, uh, I mean, the parents, the uh, teachers, and the whole education uh, systems to develop uh, and also even innovate and improve, enhance the uh, program uh, on, um, you know, to educate young people on uh, sexual and reproductive health is really important and uh, urgent right now. Um, but one of the main barriers we, we, we all see that the teachers and, and the parents, um, they are quite uh, supportive for our young people. But the main barriers comes from the management mechanism of local authority. So many times we, we face the, the difficulties in assessing and talking to uh, the departments of uh, education in some locations, some areas. Uh, and they seem to be not quite concerned when we want to bring something new to uh, the education program, the current education programs, specifically for the schools. So advocate, uh, uh, advocacy to uh, the local authorities is one of the, our top like concern and prioritize um, after we uh, uh, conduct uh, those two programs uh, in, in, in community in Asia Pacific. Yeah, next, uh, next slide, please. Yeah. And the second issue that we found out and also uh, in, um, like uh, working on in many years uh, recently in Asia Pacific is, uh, is about sub substance use uh, and these uh, consequences. Uh, among the young um, uh, key populations in Asia Pacific, because uh, you can see that uh, the 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 very uh, little height um, um, light um, at the bottom of this slide. Um, let's talk 
openly about your uh, about your use of substance. Um, it's come from the context that uh, substance use is never is never or rarely uh, openly talked among the uh, general society uh, and also the specific special especially in among the uh, young people in Asia Pacific because of the cultural cultural mindset and because of the uh, policy the political uh, issue. Um, even in uh, there are some country in 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 Asia Pacific, they are um, not some many country in Asia Pacific. They are criminalizing um, the uh, drug users, um, and uh, also the uh, the the, the um, uh, uh, how to say um, um, also the uh, right now there's a lot of the news uh, new kind of drugs. Uh, the synthetic uh, drugs have they are available um, in our life, right? And and um, the young people are trying to experience those kind of drug as uh, the, uh, the 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 you know, with or without our observations. So why don't we teach it, teach them, to educate them, to, to let them understand about the danger of the drug before they get involved in, uh, involved of any kind of uh, risky behavior like that. So that is one of our, uh, that's also one of our top prioritized concern when we working with the drug user, especially the drunk, um, the young drug user um, in, uh, in our reasons. And um, no, uh, but, um, our currently uh, communication programs in many countries right now, they still mainly focus, uh, majorly, um, majorly focus on the kind of injecting drug uh, instead, of, uh, instead of talking more about the new kind of drug, the, the one who we, uh, the one that we do uh, inject them into our body, but uh, they will lead to so many kind of um, like harmful um, issue afterwards, like uh, the mental issues and also the risky uh, sexual behaviors uh, after using uh, of, of, of the um, uh, those kind of drug, and um, uh, so uh, that's why we really need uh, um, to advocate to not only the governments, but also many organizations to uh, innovate the communication programs and uh, let them understand this uh, real reality among the young um, you know, drug, um, drug users in Asia Pacific. Yeah. Next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, yeah, so these are these are um, what I, I, I have say I have told you about uh, what we found through many years. Um, we are working with the drug users in uh, our reasons. Next slide, please. Yeah, and uh, uh, as in, as mentioned earlier, uh, COVID nineteen is one of the very huge pressures for all the governments, all of us, all the humans in um, all over the world. Uh, and let's see how it's impact to the um, young key populations specifically in, um, in our regions. Um, so um, all the government, they are, next slide please, um, uh, all the governments, they put a lot of effort to uh, try to reduce the impact of COVID-19 to um, the people in the own country. Uh, and even uh, many um, many ways uh, they have conducted to to uh, make it happen. Uh, that can be the social distance, can be the lockdown, um, or whatever. Um, but is it really how how effective it is? Um, is is um, let's let's talk about it. I I think because through uh, the many case study that we were reported from our colleges from uh, many countries, uh, member countries, our focal points. They, uh, there's many things can like surprising us 
uh, in negative way, I mean. Uh, like the social, we think that the social distance would force the people to stay at home and somehow reduce the sexual behavior of them, right? But no, the epidemic just blocked the young people from the social communication and many types of the, the entertainment. Uh, but they are still have very high demands for the risky sexual behaviors. And they, um, uh, and, uh, uh, they still try to go out to meet the people having sex, uh, what I mean, um, having sex and facing a lot of the risky behaviors. Uh, social distance would reduce the transmission through sexual behavior. No, it's wrong. It's really wrong uh, be because you know what? During the social distance, uh, uh, the health, the health care services, um, and prevention studies is, uh, are very, quite limited, and uh, and uh, um, it's like somehow the social distance reduce the accessibility of the peop of people, specifically the young people to um, that kind of uh, the protections. And uh, as the result, uh, uh, from uh, the numbers, the case study that we were reported from the country when I was, uh, when, um, where I, I came from, the Vietnam, the number of uh, uh, the... Uh, Sorry, uh, we have to wrap up. Yep. Sorry. Uh, Thank you. The last slide. Uh, Thank you. The number of people who are fighting the testing uh, service is higher. Also, the um, uh, new cases, HIV positive cases, are uh, many times higher than normal. Um, and uh, uh, and and uh, the the main reasons they they they, they told us is um, uh, that's because during during the uh, social distance they don't have enough condoms, they don't have enough the harm reduction products to protect themselves. And it was really sad story um, that we we need to focus on. And I think that uh, the distance is good, but it's not um, uh, the uh, but it's not enough for to protect our young people. And it's just a part of the prevention. So for the stakeholders and for all of our colleges, I think that we uh, have to try to stay safe yourself, but also uh, I ask you, ask your uh, collaborating corporation to deliver this kind of message to all the stakeholders. So uh, yeah, uh, that's all of uh, the information I would like to send to all of you. I Thank like, you. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for your insight of Thank reminding you. us how important safe spaces are and um, that we need to adjust the intervention and uh, prevent misunderstanding around SRH um, services and also sexual and reproductive rights. Um, and also, of course, that the current COVID-19 pandemic is really questioning our intervention and we have to think creatively and innovative in how to address young people. Thank you very much for, um, for your intervention and please stay tuned for the presentations now. Can I please remind all the participants to mute themselves and switch off the camera so we can increase the quality of the videos. And without further ado, I have the honor now to introduce our first abstract presenter. Nalini Kurana is a senior research and program associate at the International Center for Research on Women, the Asia Regional Office. Her work focuses on issues of child marriage, adolescence empowerment, men and masculinity, and gender-based violence. At present, she works, she's supporting the IKEA Foundation funded U. UMANG, U-M-A-N-G program, which aims to address child marriage and improve schools retention in Jakarta, Indonesia. Um, without further ado, I'm excited to hear your presentation titled The Cost of Growing, Intensification of Regressive Norms and Practices Impacting Adolescent Girls in the Jakarta region in India. Over to you. Good morning. Thank you so much for the introduction. 
Good morning, everyone. I hope you're all well. Uh, my name is Nalini Kurana, and I work with ICRW Asia at their New Delhi office. And today I'm going to be talking about the cost of growing up, intensification of regressive gender norms and practices impacting adolescent girls in the state of Jharkhand, India. So I hope you can see my presentation. Can you see it? Yes, yes, we can. Yes, see. we can. Great, great. So before I begin, I'd also like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak at this platform. And thank you so much to the other panelists and participants that are joining us for this discussion today. So a little bit of context for my presentation. ICRW is currently implementing a four-year action research program in Jharkhand called Umang, Empowering Girls and Ending Child Marriage. And this program works to enhance the agency and aspiration of girls in order to improve their school retention and delay age at marriage. And I'm here today as a part of a much larger Umang team that is working on this project. Uh, the Umang project is funded by the IKEA Foundation and it's being implemented by ICRW along with our local partners, Sati and Badlao Foundation, as well as Project Concern International. Today, I'm not going to be speaking so much about the program and interventions themselves. Rather, I'm going to be focusing on the key findings that have emerged from various research activities that we've conducted as part of the MUG program. So before I get into the research, a little bit about the geographical context. So Jharkhand is a state located in the eastern part of India, as you can see on the map. And Umang is being implemented in two districts of Jharkhand, Gorda and Jamtara. So Gorda and Jamtara are two primarily rural districts, and they perform quite poorly on indicators related to literacy, education, and health. Um, there's poor infrastructure, uh, widespread poverty, and lack of livelihood opportunities. And child marriage is also quite rampant in these districts. So as you can see, the proportion of women aged 20 to 24 married before the age of 18 is at 64% in Gorda district and 44% in Jamtara district which is significantly higher than the proportion for Jharkhand or uh, for India as a whole. So coming to the, uh, to the research, my presentation basically draws on three research activities we've conducted as part of Umang. The first is the baseline survey, which was a quantitative survey conducted with over 4,000 adolescent girls aged 10 to 14 and 15 to 18 years, with the aim of capturing baseline status on various key indicators. The second research activity is the formative study, which was a qualitative study undertaken with adolescent girls and boys as well as their parents to understand norms and practices at the community level. And the third study, which is the most recent, is the COVID-19 survey and group discussion. So we conducted these discussions with a cadre of almost 120 field level staff that are working as part of the MUNG program. So these are based in the villages where we work. Uh, and we did these discussions to get a sense of how COVID-19 has impacted the communities with whom we work, particularly at the family level and particularly for vulnerable groups like adolescent girls. So before I get into the key findings, I want to talk a little bit about what it means for a girl to quote unquote grow up, right? Because that is a very loaded term and it comes with different meanings and connotations and implications. So for girls, growing up is usually getting linked to biological change, puberty, readiness to bear children, and menarche, or the onset of menstruation, becomes a really important symbol or signifier for this process of growing up. And we can very clearly see the ways in which the norms, rules, and expectations that shape the lives of girls change as they transition from younger to older adolescents. So as girls grow up, our data, our data actually indicates that they experience a tightening of these regressive norms and an increased set of controls and restrictions on their lives. So I'm going to share data on some key indicators in the lives of girls, taking four of the thematic areas as presented on the slide, education, marriage, mobility, and SRH. And I'd like to highlight the ways in which the gender norms share each and every one of these and determine how girls navigate this process of growing up. So coming to the key findings, um, one of the key areas where we observe this process of growing up is in terms of education. So as girls grow up, we see very clearly that their attendance in school drops dramatically and they are much more prone to dropping out from school. So this line graph on the slide really shows the proportion of girls who are in school by age. And as you can see, this proportion drops quite significantly after the age of 14. So overall in the 15 to 18 year old age group, only 50% of girls are still left in school. So we asked girls about the reasons for this dropout and a few main push factors emerged. So the first is about expenses related to school. So given the way that the school system functions, generally the cost of uh, education increases after grade eight. But we see that gender roles also influence the ways in which investment is made in the education of a girl, particularly at the family level, and the ways in which the resources are allocated at the family level. So even though parents largely support girls' education, 
in a context of poverty, in a context of limited resources, they would rather invest their money in the education of their sons, who will go on to become breadwinners and earn for the family, rather than investing in the education of their daughters, who will get married off into a different family and will assume a primarily domestic role there. So I'd like to bring your attention to this quote here from an adolescent girl in red. And she said, she said, what is the point of studying more if girls are destined to get married and do kitchen work only? So this shows that the socialization of these gender roles is really strong. And almost 90% girls of girls actually believe that women's primary role is that of a caregiver. So these domestic roles start to set in at a very early age. But older girls in particular, age 15 to 18, are the ones who have to very seriously take on these domestic roles in the household. And this again becomes a reason for them to start missing days of school and eventually contributing to drop out as well. Third is the issue of schools being inaccessible or too far. So distance of schools catering to grades 9, 10, and 11, 12 is further away. So that is a major contributor to dropout. But it's also very much linked to parents' concerns around the safety of their daughter. And it's also very interesting to see how parents think about safety. Because on the one hand, parents feel that their daughters might experience harassment or violence on the way to school. But on the other hand, parents are also very scared that a girl might meet a boy or develop friendships or relationships with a boy on the way to school, or she might not be going to school at all. So this is a huge cultural transgression given the community and cultural norms, particularly for older girls who are quote-unquote grown up or of age. So this is seen to reflect upon the character of the girl herself. It also has implications for the family reputation and honor. So this whole idea of protection of girls from such kind of transgressions also becomes a push factor for older girls to drop out from school. Coming next to the issue of marriage, our data shows that girls are married quite early and they have very little voice and choice. So marriage is almost non-existent among the 10 to 14 year old age group, but we see that 23% of girls aged 15 to 18 are either married or have their marriage fixed. And for married girls, the average age, is, age of marriage is just 16, although they wish to have married at the age of 18, and unmarried girls desire to get married at the age of 21. Our data also clearly shows a link between education and marriage, and it shows that dropout from school significantly increases the likelihood of marriage. So in the previous slide, I talked about how dropout from school is a huge issue as girls start to grow up. And we find that girls who have dropped out from school become 3.4 times more likely to be married or have their marriage fixed. So as soon as a girl drops out from school, marriage is usually right around the corner for her. Also referring back to what I said about, about the gap between girls' actual age at marriage and the age at which they would like to marry, the reason for this gap is that girls actually don't have much of a say in decisions related to their marriage, particularly the timing of marriage and the choice of group. So fathers of the girls are the key decision makers on these decisions, and parents actually prefer that girls should marry a groom of their choice. So this is very much linked to, the, the norms around the choice of groom are very strong, and it's very linked to rules that determine the way that the marriage market operates, where issues of community, class, religion, caste, especially caste purity, uh, become really important determinants of how a suitable match is chosen. So parents really don't want their daughters to be going out and talking to boys, developing friendships or relationships, as these might again result in some kind of transgression of these social rules. So as we can see in this quote from a father, he said, this is the era of mobiles. We fear that our daughter might start talking to someone, so it's better to get her married. So marriage becomes a solution, you know, a socially acceptable solution to all these concerns related to the sexuality of girls. And our data also shows that although girls believe that they should have a say in deciding the timing of their marriage or the choice of the groom, less than half of girls actually felt that it was acceptable for them to express their disagreement with the choice made by their parents. So girls themselves have internalized that it's not appropriate for them to have a say in these decisions related to their own marriage. Coming next to the issue of mobility, we see that as girls grow older, there's a change in their mobility patterns with very specific types of controls and restrictions in place. So generally, both younger and older girls need permission to be able to visit different places in the community, and they must usually be accompanied to visit those places. But we see that mobility is also very much conditional on such, uh, different things. For example, where is a girl going? Why is she going there? Who might she encounter there? How far is it from home? And there was a lot of interesting data on this, but I want to kind of pick out one issue which was very much, uh, very interesting. And what we found was that when it comes to a place that a girl would visit for some kind of household work or responsibility, for example, if she's visiting an Anganwadi center, which is a center where she would visit a front, female frontline worker to access some kind of resource, related to maybe health or immunization or nutrition, uh, older girls are freer than younger girls to visit these kinds of places without permission or without being accompanied. 
but when it comes to places like a playground or a park or visiting a friend's home or even visiting school we find that older girls are actually more likely to need permission permission to visit these places as compared to younger girls so this basically means that as girls grow up they experience very specific changes in those restrictions on mobility so it's acceptable for them to go out for certain household work or responsibilities or duties but it's not acceptable for them for these grown up girls to be going out to play or to meet their friends or to have fun right so this also reflects in the data that shows that older girls are less likely than younger girls to go out to play or to meet their friends and when they do meet their friends they generally meet them in spaces that are private spaces like the home of a friend rather than a public space like a playground or a market and the last thematic area i want to talk about is sexual and reproductive health particularly information and communication around communication around srs so overall we find that there are very low levels of knowledge and high stigma around these issues younger girls really lack information related to menstruation and there's a widespread belief in different kinds of misinformation myths and stereotypes around menstruation even among older girls similarly on contraception and pregnancy we find that older girls uh, lack information on these issues and they also believe in certain stereotypes for example using contraception is wrong or girls who use contraception are promiscuous so this again links back to gender norms around sexuality and sexual activity before or outside of marriage there's also very little communication happening on the issue of srs so discussion on menstruation is absent for younger girls although some older girls do talk about it with their mothers uh, but there's almost no communication happening at all uh, on pregnancy and contraception so what we see is that you know girls don't want to speak to their parents siblings friends or teachers about these issues and they share that they feel embarrassed talking about these issues even with their friends the only girls who do discuss these topics are older uh, are married girls and they discuss them with their husbands sometimes but it's usually when the husband in a case discusses so overall what we see is that you know adolescent girls are entering into relationships they're entering into marriage as early as the age of 16 uh, you know there's without very little knowledge and understanding of sexual and reproductive health a whole lot of stigma surrounding these issues and overall a lack of safe space to talk about these and this has implications not only on their health but also on their overall well-being in the longer term you know moving into adult life so i'd also like to briefly address the elephant in the room or in this case the elephant on zoom and that is the question of how covid-19 has affected all of us and what we found from our discussions with our field staff is that covid-19 has generally made things quite a lot worse particularly for older adults and girls So just to give an example because of the poor economic situation many mothers have started going out to uh, supplement the family income therefore the burden of household work and chores is falling entirely now on older adolescent girls and their work has also increased due to the presence of all family members being at home in the lockdown so girls are busy for the entire day doing various chores they really don't have time for leisure to read to play uh, you know to study and we see that adolescent boys you know their brothers conversely are going out to play cricket or they're meeting friends they're chatting on whatsapp etc so there's a really lopsided kind of you know division and gender division of work that is falling on adolescent girls and these girls are also struggling with access to for example sanitary pads access to sexual and reproductive health products uh, we find that they're experiencing an increased sense of insecurity due to the prolonged presence of men in the home so men who were usually out to work or men who had migrated out to cities for work So the situation is quite difficult for older adolescent girls, and there's also a very strong emerging concern that when schools actually reopen, many girls girls won't be able to rejoin school, and the marriage of many girls will also be fixed when the situation improves or uh, you know lockdown restrictions are lifted. So last slide, you know, I've painted a bit of a grim picture here of what is happening in the lives of girls, and unfortunately, that's the reality. But the great thing is that there are many ways to address these entrenched norms and issues, and the Umang project is working really hard on. This. So at ICRW we strongly believe in the socio-ecological approach where issues like this should be addressed at multiple levels and by engaging with multiple stakeholders. So girls are at the very center of this approach but it's also essential to engage with those in the ecology of girls right so that would be their parents their families uh, you know their community members institutions and other structures that govern their lives so the overall goal is to create an enabling environment create an enabling environment for girls So as a result the Umang program has interventions targeted at various layers of the ecosystem. So just to give an example we talked about how fathers are the key decision makers in the lives of girls. So the Umang program has a specific component to engage with men and boys to deconstruct some of these harmful norms we talked about and to help them understand and envision a different life for their daughters for their sisters for their wives. And in the covid situation particularly the Umang program has had to adapt of course and come up with new creative strategies. And one of these is to leverage the situation to promote the leadership and entrepreneurship of adolescent girls. 
So many of the girls who are part of our program, who are part of our community level groups, have taken the initiative to, you know, start making and distributing masks in their villages. Uh, you know, they're teaching fellow community members, coming together with other girls to teach community members about social distancing, about proper hand washing methods, etc. So the overall goal here is to encourage the leadership of girls and to, vis you know, visibilize them as capable and independent agents in the community as well. So I'll stop here. I can keep going on about the intervention, uh, but I'd be happy to answer more questions on the research as well as the intervention uh, in the Q&A session. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for this great presentation. Um, also reminding the participants if they have questions to the panelists, please um, either put it in the chat or on Facebook. Um, Nalini gave us a good overview about the in intersectionality of different factors, education, marriage, uh, mobility and SRH and also the the solid socialization with social norms on that and that there is a long way to go especially engaging all layers of society um, boys men parents institutions to to create a change for those young and go um, for those young girls and women um, in India Moving on to the next presentation now, it's my honor to present SM Shaikat. He is an executive director of, of SERAS, S-E-R-A-C, which is a youth-focused rights and development organization that advocates and implements programs on access to family planning and reproductive health and rights for youth, the prevention of child marriage and other harmful practices such as gender-based violence in Bangladesh. Um, Shekhar has worked with a number of global youth agencies, including as a woman deliver young leader and as ambassador for young men in gender, for gender equality. He initiated the, the Bangladesh National Youth Conference um, in 2016, and the National Youth Conference for Family Planning also continued in 2017 and 18. Um, it's my pleasure now to, um, to ask Chaikat for the floor. He will present his abstract, ensuring youth voices by establishing sustainable national platforms for SRHR. Please take the floor. Thank you very Thank much. You, Thank you, Adrian. Thank you. So uh, it's my pleasure to uh, be on this panel today and uh, thank you to APCR Stitcher uh, for uh, hosting me and uh, giving me the opportunity to present uh, what we have been doing in Bangladesh for over the last four years. So um, to the audience uh, um, on this panel and uh, uh, this is uh, what you see on the screen that uh, uh, there is a bunch of young people uh, on the screen and this is the uh, organizing committee of the Bangladesh National Youth Conference on Family Planning last year. And uh, the smiling faces, um, and uh, it, it, it shows up how uh, they enjoyed uh, in organizing such a platform for youth. Uh, and after the successful conference, uh, this is what it looks like uh, from the organizers. Uh, so if we, if we move on to the next slide, please. Okay, thank you so much. So if uh, I'd like to go back to 2016, uh, four years back from now, uh, when I participated in the International Conference on Family Planning in uh, Indonesia, Bali, uh, where um, like many of the young people, I too promised to you know, have some sort of local action from this global platform that uh, I would organize uh, a similar type of uh, conference or like an event in Bangladesh that would engage uh, young people from across the country. So uh, I didn't forget my promise. So when I, when I was back in, in country, uh, I, I started you know, discussing with my team and, and how we can make uh, you know, something that, that sustains and that can regularly engage young people uh, and, and make them, uh, you know, a space where they can raise their voices. Uh, if, if I, you know, relate this with the country context, because the Bangladesh has practiced a very progressive rate of um, contraceptive prevalence rate in the last, uh, in, in, the, in less than 40 years from 8% uh, in 1975 to 62% uh, in 2014, according to the Bangladesh Demograph Demographic Health Survey. 
uh, what is the total fertility rate is 2.07% uh, according to the last uh, latest UNFP report. Uh, though the sexual reproductive health and rights are part of fundamental rights for youth, the consequences are vice versa. Uh, currently, Bangladesh government had, has taken strategic action plans and uh, a lot of other action plans to uh, uh, realize uh, and focus uh, certain aspects of SRHR, but the theme of SRHR in Bangladesh remains too difficult to discuss openly, particularly among adolescents, uh, despite its important uh, in its uh, in this delicate stage of their life. Uh, so, and also, you know, this background and with the ICFP and the promises for from the young people, uh, there was another event hosted in Dhaka, which is uh, the uh, international. Uh, Congress on the uh, Asia Pacific uh, on AIDS ICAP in 2016, where we um, gathered around 35 young people from across the country, and these people uh, ultimately, you know, they uh, supported the formation of the first uh, national organizing committee of uh, of the National Youth Conference on Family Planning. Uh, but the the idea was very uh, kind of a wild idea to the uh, traditional. Uh, SRHA leaders and also uh, the ongoing uh, country programs that had been there. So, um, uh, would you like to go to the next slide? Yeah. So, how we actually did this? Uh, so, it was in 2016 when um, uh, many of those events were taking place, including the ICAP, the ICAP, and other events. So, we um, so around 35 young people, we decided to organize uh, uh, some sort of a, a, a national level uh, sustainable platform. And we declared the National Youth Conference on Family Planning uh, to be hosted in September, 2016. So, and why we did this? Because the need of family planning contraceptive methods it was increasing. It was, um, and, uh, at, and almost one third of the pregnancies in the country were still un unintended because of unwillingness of contraceptive use. And uh, Bangladesh has the highest adolescent fertility rate in South Asia, where one in 10 girl has uh, a child before the age of 15, uh, whereas one in three adolescents become mother or pregnant by the age of 19. So this is really uh, some, some of the facts that pushed young people to think that this is their conference, this is their event or a platform they need to you know, speak and communicate their uh, challenges they face. Um, so we reached out to a few, uh, you know, uh, the leading SRHR experts, including on the screen. If we look, if we look at uh, on the on a panel, uh, this is the first conference and first session. On the uh, uh, on the panel, there is the uh, director of the director general of family planning is speaking on his uh, right, uh, uh, far right. There is the family planning. 2020 CSO focal point, uh, Dr. Faisal. So we discussed with these senior leaders as well, like how we can do that. And um, so we um, we were much supported uh, strategically uh, and with, you know, like the motivation that yes, you guys should go ahead. And then, um, and it was really some, some it, it, it was a challenging uh, event for us, but uh, we had a vision, which is, we do not want this conference like once at a time, but we we'll, we want this to continue. So that so what what we did we named the conference as Bangladesh First National Conference, not just Bangladesh National Conference. It's, it was the first. So we had uh, in mind there will be you know a serial in in next year and then the year year coming after. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. Okay, so and after the first conference, we had uh, 100 youth delegates from across the country. So we tried to try our level best to communicate with youth organizations, the organizations that are actively working on SRHR, the leading the programs in the country, the government institutions, and you know organizations that are not represented mostly in terms of youth, uh, youth and SRHR issues. So we, we brought them, you know, front in the front. And in 2017, on the second year, uh, we increased the number of the young people, uh, you know, to join. So we increased them uh, in, in up to one and 150. And this time we had more, uh, you know, more uh, uh, 
more people, in, including the ministers, uh, parliament members, SRHR experts, uh, the family planning directorate. And the good, the good thing was from the beginning of this conference, one thing was common, which is the director general of the family planning department, who is the head of the executives in the department. The, that, uh, so the director general used to join and inaugurate the conference. So this became kind of like a custom uh, that this conference has a very good communication with the director general. Um, and then we also had a very good, uh, uh, very good uh, communication with the media. So it gave us a very good coverage. Uh, uh, yeah. So, and then we uh, marched into 2018, where the third BNYCFP, we had over three, uh, about 300 young people, like double the number. And we brought together many of the international organizations, the UN organization, including the UNFPA Bangladesh, um, uh, INGOs, uh, and, and, and a lot of uh, family planning and population experts in the, in the floor. The third BNYCP was, was really a kind of a turning point for us because this time the government pleased to be with us uh, every, every year it, it, it is coming up. And then on the fourth BNYCP last year, we increased another 50 uh, uh, participants, which uh, um, uh, accounted to 350 young people. And, and this time as well, the parliament members, uh, you know, ministers, uh, United Nations organizations, including UNICEF, UNFPA, and youth organizations especially. So what we did is there are like two days conference with uh, over 24, different concurrent and panel sessions that has very high level engagements and as well uh, as well as their skill building sessions and um, and and many uh, you know innovative innovative events within the conference side events within the conference so it actually you know gave them a very good flavor of um, very good flavor of sorry i think i Okay, sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, sorry, I muted. So, um, and it, it gave them a very good flavor of an international conference as well. But at the same time, what we did over the last four years is every year, the number of delegates we, we brought in the conference, we gathered them in one social media space so that they remain active and they bring out new issues. And it, is, it becomes a virtual space for them to discuss and to you know, put forward uh, recommendations and policy suggestions they want to be involved in. And also we, uh, we, we have been, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the platform has been uh, including the young delegates uh, into the next organizing committee. So the faces you saw on the first um, slide, they were actually, all of them, almost all of them were from the first conference or, or, or the second or third conference. They, uh, they were uh, delegates and then they became the um, organizing committee. So it's like a youth led process. So they know, you know how to organize a conference from a participant to an organizer and not just an organizer, how to account uh, the government policymakers. Just an example I, I can give you that, um, uh, if you go to the next slide, please. Okay, so, uh, so, so in 2018, so there was a, a session on uh, uh, family planning and access to vulnerable populations. So on that panel, there was the director of the family planning department. And then one of the uh, uh, participants who, who was a person with disability, she raised a question like, do you have any uh, services for us? I mean, the person with disabilities. And then it was like a pin drop silence in the room and the director could not answer. So uh, he just took the question and he said like, I will do, or I will try to do something. And on the next year, when, when we had another meeting on another, you know, on another meeting in a different occasion with them. So he raised the question in, the, uh, in one of the national steering committee meeting that I was asked this question on this conference and we need to make some sort of change because this department has been doing a lot over the last 40 years, but we did not notice that we have been missing a big group of population. So let us do and make 
some sort of change that uh, you know that 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 helps them uh, access our services. So this is uh, just a just small example. There are you know uh, dozens of examples of where the director general, parliamentarians, the ministers, including the educa current education minister, like everyone was asked like wild questions by the uh, participants who could never do that in a general situation. So this conference gave them this space and uh, the opportunity. On this particular slide, if we look at on the back, there are the former law ministers sitting in the back and also there are uh, multiple other uh, 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 international and national um, uh, policymakers uh, sitting in the with the with the young people, but we put young people in the front. So this is the uh, this is this is the main model of the conference. The young people should go first, and they their voices first. Please next. Okay. So the methods that we, how we do that, because uh, when I have been presenting this, uh, I believe that there would be participants on this panel who would like to know like how, if we, if you are interested to do something in your country, uh, I thank you, Hedron, for <laughs> giving me the notice. Okay, so, uh, okay, the first thing is that you can, uh, you have, have to have a plan to reach out to uh, the, every corner of your country because uh, geographic presentation is really important as well as diverse diversity and other uh, uh, other marginal group presentation. Uh, you must also have a plan to take commitments from the youth organizations and the other groups uh, who will be involved in the process. So otherwise it will not be taken forward. And then the engaging, uh, you know, you, you must engage the interest groups because otherwise the resource mobilization and, you know, moving this conference or this kind of an event or platform forward would be really difficult. And if we go to the next slide, please. Okay, so uh, the outcome that we are enjoying currently is a sustainability, sustainable advocacy space where an accountability space. What uh, in every uh, almost every organization working on SRHR and family planning in Bangladesh, they consider this particular conference the annual space where young people and they would come together to ask and account the policymaker. So this is an achievement that this event uh, is delivering currently. Go ahead, next, please. Next, please. Take away. So the, the takeaway is, uh, so it is, it increases the cooperation and net, you know, uh, a networking opportunity between young people and uh, policymakers. And uh, I believe that this kind of events uh, where, where young people are put forward and their voices are heard with uh, importance, this kind of events should take place in every country in everywhere in the, in, in the world. And we, uh, at CIRAC are very happy to uh, support if we are asked or we are reached for any such support in, in the future. Uh, thank you so much for uh, giving us the opportunity to present and uh, we also look forward to host the BNYCP 2020 this year. And many of, I would like to invite many of you to register and please join us there. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation, uh, first and foremost. It was very interesting to see how in an international conference trickled down to the national level and really made a change there. This is what an International Youth Day 2020 is really all about, talking about those processes. And congratulations on building such a sustainable platform um, a safe space for youth dialogue, for policy exchange, and also for pointing out that it is important to ask the right questions at the right point in time to really make a change at the national level. Um, and this will bring us to the third presentation today, um, looking on SRH issues from a different angle. Um, Nicole Bannister is a partnerships coordination for Grassroots Soccer, where she spent the past five years leveraging multi-sectorial relationships across government, the private sector, and community-based stakeholders to execute, uh, to execute sustainable social impact programs. She helps to redefine SRH for adolescents globally through innovative sports-based public health initiatives. So very different approach that our other panelists have taken. Um, so I'm excited to hear about that. Nicole is also in United Nations Alliance for Civilization Fellow, a return Peace Corps volunteer and the founder of My Basketball Team Digital, 
um, storytelling platform. She will present today her research on leveraging sport to improve perceptions of violence and sexual reproductive health and rights for adolescents. Insights gained from grassroots soccer play based approach in Papua New Guinea. Uh, without further ado, Nicole, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Can I just confirm that everyone can see my slides? Yes, we can see you and the slides. <laughs> Fantastic. Excellent. Well, hi, everyone. Thank you so much to the conference organizers and to everyone who is tuning in. It is an absolute pleasure to be here. And thank you so much for having me. Um, as was mentioned, my name is Nicole Bannister, and I am the Partnerships Coordinator for Grassroots Soccer. Today, I'll be sharing more about how Grassroots Soccer, or GRS for short, is leveraging sports and play-based activity to improve sexual and reproductive health and rights and perceptions of violence for adolescents in Papua New Guinea. Grassroots Soccer is an adolescent health organization that leverages the power of soccer, the world's most beautiful game, to mobilize youth to overcome their greatest health challenges and be agents for change in their communities. Since our inception in 2002, Grassroots Soccer has reached over 2 million young people with our sports-based health promotion activities across 62 different countries. Grassroots Soccer's delivery model uses what we call the three C's, coaches, curriculum, and culture. Coaches are young, motivated social change agents in communities globally who care about and are passionate about uplifting youth. These coaches deliver Grassroots Soccer's evidence-based curricula that have different practices in them and using soccer activities with key messages around health. Grassroots Soccer's culture is the fun, high-energy, play-based environment that our coaches create in order to ensure that you feel safe and comfortable when discussing really sensitive topics like GBV and sexual health. GRS uses this delivery model, the three C's, in order to achieve impact across the three A's. We want to strengthen young people's assets, their health knowledge, and the self-efficacy to use it. We want to increase young people's access to youth-friendly health services. And we want to ensure that these young people then adhere to treatment regimens and healthy lifestyles even after they've graduated from our programs. Grassroots Soccer has been working in Papua New Guinea since 2017, and although we work with a variety of different partners across PNG in different ways, this abstract is specifically focusing on our work with three partners. The first partner is ExxonMobil, both the foundation based in the United States as well as the local ExxonMobil affiliate in PNG. The second partner is YWCA, who is one of our implementing partners in Port Moresby, the very urban capital of PNG. And our third partner is SSDA, another one of our implementing partners, facilitating programming in Mendi in the Southern Highlands province, which is really quite rural. GRS and our partners in PNG have developed two programs for adolescents. One is called Skills Malaria, and one is Relationship Skills. Skills Malaria is a sport based malaria prevention and awareness program and relationship skills, which is what I will be discussing with you now, is our SRHR GBV focused program. Grassroots Soccer provides technical assistance to these partners to inform their strategy and operations for adolescent programming that happens both in school and out of school across these both urban and rural environments. So gender-based violence is a huge challenge in PNG. 66% of women are estimated to have experienced physical or sexual violence. 41% of men admit to perpetrating rape. And two thirds of women have reported experiencing domestic violence. And that's just what's reported. When you think about this in the context of how young PNG is, 40% of the population are adolescents under 15 years old. And then couple that with this super diverse cultural context where PNG has over 800 different languages and tribes spaced out across, across vastly different, you know, urban and rural environments, there's really a huge opportunity to supporting um, gender-based violence prevention and gender equitable programming that targets youth specifically in PNG. 
Again, Relationship Skills is Grassroots Soccer's SRHR and Gender Empowerment Program in PNG. Our partners, YWCA and SSDA, first recruited coaches in both Port Moresby and Mendy, where they were operating respectively. Remember, these are not actual soccer coaches. When we refer to coaches, I mean young community change agents, typically between 18 and 35 years old, who love working with youth and have an interest in sexual and reproductive health. Each of these coaches attended a week-long intensive training hosted by GRS, which encompassed best practices for working with youth, accurate SRHR information, disclosures, referrals to health services, and practical application of the curriculum content. The relationship skills curriculum was developed by a dynamic group of stakeholders, validated and approved by both our partners and young people themselves. It's evidence-based, it's contextualized for PNG, and there are eight one-hour practices designed for mixed-sex groups of adolescents. And the adolescents in our programs are all between 13 and 19 years old. The coaches worked in pairs, so one female and one male coach working together to co-facilitate the curriculum with groups of 20 to 40 participants per practice. Key themes in this curriculum include rights and responsibilities, gender and power, healthy communication and relationships, forms of GBV and where to access services, and then critical SRHR information, including you know, puberty, menstruation, uh, contraception, HIV and STI prevention, et cetera. Um, both the broader relationship skills program and the curriculum specifically are designed to be active, youth-friendly, and fun. Our coaches use praise, energizers, icebreakers, and sports activities, again, to create this safe space for both the girls and the boys in their groups to open up to the coaches about sensitive issues in their lives and then be connected directly to health services. For this project, GRS analyzed routine monitoring data collected from interventions conducted between January and September 2019. This included attendance registers completed by coaches at each session and pre and post test questionnaires completed by participants immediately before and after the intervention. The pre and post data was cleaned and coded in Excel, and then we used SPSS to conduct McNamara's chi-square test for significance of individual items. 620 participants were included in these results with 91% attending at least six of the eight practices in the program. There were nearly equal numbers of female and male participants, and we're gonna discuss the pre and post results just now. So this table shows results from each of the 13 pre and post items administered to participants. It includes the proportion of participants who gave the desired or favorable response on each item at baseline and end line, the percent change and the p-value, again, from McNamara's chi-square test. The items with the largest changes are shaded dark green with greater than 20% positive change over the course of the intervention. The item with the largest percent change was number seven. I know who to go to if I or someone I know is abused with a 32.3% change from baseline to endline. There was also a 29.6% positive change on item number two. I would tell someone if I were touched in a manner that made me uncomfortable. The items in light green show changes of between 10 and 20% and the lightest items show a change of under 10%. The blue p-values on items 10 and 12 indicate not statistically significant change, while the item shaded in red, number eight, showed a significant negative change. I'm going to come back to items 8, 10, and 12, which all deal with gender-based violence. So first, I want to highlight some of the key positive results where statistically significant positive change was observed. Participant knowledge of where to report abuse, self-efficacy to report unwanted touching, and self-efficacy for communication with the opposite sex showed the largest changes from baseline to endline. Knowledge of unequal power as a risk for HIV, self-efficacy to say no to sex, and gender equitable attitudes also significantly improved over the course of this intervention. Um, these results indicate that grassroots soccer's relationship skills participants showed positive changes on many of the key program outcomes. And during my many trips to PNG over the past three years that we've been working there, I have heard directly from the coaches that this program has made a significant impact on how they liaise with members of the opposite sex and how they approach sexual relationships. So overall, really encouraging to see and hear about these changes in behaviors and attitudes. 
Where we observe significant negative change or not significant positive change on items 8, 10, and 12, we further examine the results by implementing partner and by sex of the participants in the program. The end line values in green show positive change that was not significant. The end line values in black show negative change that was not significant. And the values in red show significant negative change. On item number eight, SSDA participants showed significant negative change. So as a reminder, these tables are showing the proportion of participants giving the favorable response, which on these three items is actually to disagree with the statement. We want the young people to disagree with the statement. Sometimes a man may have good reason to hit his girlfriend or wife. Okay. Um, however, on items 10 and 12, the SSDA participants show a much lower baseline value and greater positive change than the YWCA participants. When examining these results by sex, female and male participants show similar values and change on item 10, but male participants show positive change on item 12 and female participants do not. On item 8, female participants show a significant negative change, while male participants show just a slight negative change. You know, we can hypothesize a few explanations for these results. The differences between SSDA and YWCA participants may result from the vastly different context in which they operate. SSDA is very rural. They're, they're operating in a very rural part of PNG, while YWCA is very urban. This may explain the different values on items 10 and 12, but maybe not number eight. Um, it's also possible that participants misunderstood the items on the pre and post test, that the desired answer was to disagree with the statements. These three items are the only ones worded as such on this pre and post test. Finally, it's also possible that the intervention actually did have a negative effect on these participants' attitudes toward GBV. However, we know anecdotally from our partners that for many of both you know, these participants and coaches, Grassroots Soccer's program is the first time they have learned about or ever discussed topics such as gender, power, you know, and, and gender-based violence. So we do think there may have simply been some confusion. Regardless, it's absolutely critical to further examine these surprising findings given the very common experiences of violence in PNG and the other positive changes observed from the intervention. So this is my last slide. Grassroots Soccer is honestly really thrilled to observe overall encouraging positive results on SRHR knowledge, self-efficacy, and gender equitable attitudes through our program in PNG. We do plan to revisit the pre and post questionnaire with our partners to investigate some of the unexpected findings um, on attitudes toward violence, and we may conduct additional training, you know, or implement changes to our tool. Um, and this year, you know, despite setbacks due to coronavirus, we are still collaborating with diverse partners and stakeholders to work toward more gender sensitive transformative programming in PNG. Both YWCA and SSCA are already implementing Grassroots Soccer's program and one student recently shared with us, thank you Grassroots Soccer for coming to our school and teaching us about the important values and issues affecting both genders, breaking down strong cultural barriers and how you know we can now share responsibilities and help girls in having a balance of respect. So thank you so much, everyone. It's been an absolute pleasure you know, sharing this with you all. And I look forward to any further questions at the end. Thank you, Nicole. Thanks to the, for the reminder to all the participants to leave questions either in the chat or on Facebook and for your inspiring presentation, really, that uh, really figuring out how to make a change, how soccer can contribute to ending GBV by building young people's assets and make for making healthy choices and increasing their S, uh, access to SRH services and but also teaching them life skills and relationship skills really impressive how as you said most beautiful sport in the world can make a difference and not only in rural areas and not only in urban areas but also in rural areas um, that we can really make a difference by providing safe spaces um, and with that, we are at the last presentation. Um, it is my real pleasure to um, present to you Dr. Xiang Sheng Lim, who is an applied researcher with more than 15 years of research and programming experience. And we are really honored to have you here today. Um, she focuses on global health, especially in, especially in areas related to sexual and reproductive health, abortion, HIV, gender-based violence, 
aging, cognitive functions, impairment, and non-communicable diseases and health systems. Her research largely focuses on how complex contextual factors such as social, cultural, policies and systems influence people's health-related behaviors and decisions. Dr. Lim has um, been awarded with the postdoctoral fellowship program of the United Nations University International Institute for Global Health in 2018. And we are excited to hear from you and your presentation titled Overprotected and Underserved Legal Barriers to Young People's Access to Sexual and Reproductive Health Services in Southeast Asia Country. Without further ado, please go ahead. We can Sorry, see... I forgot yes. I'm on mute. Yeah. Great. Great to <laughs> yes. see you. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, thank you, Heidi. Uh, yeah, I will stop my uh, video because it seems like my internet is not stable uh, in the screen, uh, in my screen that shows that. But I'm happy to be here. And I mean, I'm very proud for APCI, to join APCI SH for this presentation. On behalf of on behalf of my co-author, uh, Mr. Brian from IPPF Issue, as well as uh, Nora, Miss Nora from the Indonesia Planned Parenthood uh, Association, we are delighted to be here to share our study finding on the overprotected and underserved legal barriers to young people access to uh, sexual and reproductive health services in Southeast Asia country. So this is some of the outline of my presentation. I will talk about, I will give you an overview of the sexual and reproductive health of the young people in Asia and the uh, uh, Pacific. And then I will share some of my study finding and come with the conclusion and recommendation. Just let me start to talk about the, give you some overview of the uh, sexual and reproductive health of young people in, the, in Asia and the Pacific. There are almost 1, million, 1 billion young people aged between uh, 20, 10 to 24 years old living in the Asia and the Pacific, accounting for more than one quarter of the population in this region. These young people live in diverse social, cultural and economic contexts, and yet they share important challenges and opportunities related to their sexual and reproductive health. A significant proportion of the young people in the region are sexually active, while many of them are actually their sexual activity is associated within the marriage, marriage context, an increasing number of them are initiating sex before marriage. The available information indicates that most young people are well prepared for this transition due to the lack of comprehensive sexuality education, which lead to the insufficient knowledge and life skills to negotiate sex. Uh, and consensual uh, relationship and facing considerable barriers to access services and contraceptive uh, needed to avoid unsafe sex and in consequences. A uh, study have found that one in seven uh, girls in this region have given birth by the age of 18 and often in the context of high unmet needs for contraception on child marriage, with more than one third of the girls married before their 18th birthday. And 63% of the adolescent pregnancy in this region are unintended, contributing to significant, although underreported, burden of unsafe abortion. While knowledge of condom is generally high among the young people in, uh, for most of the country, but how, however, most of them, less than half of them, also say that uh, they are reported the, uh, the condom use in last higher, sex, uh, sexual, higher risk of sexual behavior. Higher risk of sexual behavior, including early sexual activity, multiple partners, and sex under the influence of alcohol are prevalent in some countries. And up to the 10% uh, of males and 20% of the females uh, reporting they have had STI symptoms in the last 12 months. There are also an estimated of 620,000 young people living in, uh, HIV, uh, living in HIV uh, with HIV in 2014 in this region. Poor sexual and reproductive health not only impacted the health and well-being of young people, but also significant social economic implications impacting on education, economic participation, and poverty. These ne negative consequences extend to young people, families, and future generations, which can perpetrate a cycle of poor health and disadvantage. So our study uh, uh, on overprotected and underserved legal barriers to young people access in Southeast Asia country 
uh, actually, we found that as, uh, access to SRH services for young, for why we have this study, because we found that access to SRH services for young adults are shaped and limited by various contextual factors, including social and, uh, social and cultural norms and law. However, little research has been conducted to understand the country laws and its intersection with social and cultural norms, especially in Southeast Asia country. Therefore, this study is aimed to this, uh, determine the impact of law and its intersection with other contextual factors on young people's access to sexual and reproductive health services in Indonesia, Malaysia, and Philippines. And this study is a research project conducted on behalf of the International Planned Parenthood Federation with the support from UNFPA. Uh, this study Actually, it was developed and uh, the methodology for this research draws and expands upon a pilot multi-country study conducted by Coram International and, the, uh, and IPPF in uh, El Salvador, Senegal and United Kingdom in 2012 to 2013. And for this, uh, for our study, is a, it will be designed as an exploratory study conducted in three countries, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Philippines. As a descriptive cross-sessional study, we apply the same methodology conducted by Coram International in conjunction uh, by using the uh, question as the ways. And also, we also conducted the semi-structured -inter semi interviews and focus group discussion from the perspective from uh, both demand, which is youth, and supply perspective, which is healthcare provider perspective. Okay, what do we found in the study? In many countries, registration restricts uh, access to SRH services, particularly for young people. Law that made difficult for young people to access SRH services are often derived from a protectionist uh, approach to young people sexuality. So normally when we have this law and these rules and this policy or governance uh, structure, it's basically we, draw, uh, we develop it from a protectionist approach. The belief that young people should be protected from the harm that might result from sexual activity or exploitation. In Malaysia, Indonesia and Philippines, Young people, what we found is young people may only legally access to sexual and reproductive health services with the consent from their parents or their spouse. In Philippines, while the reproductive health act stated that no person should be denied to family planning services and information, the section 7 of the reproductive health act articulates a parent, a parent or a guardian consent requirement for minor, which is under 18 years old, to assess modern method for family planning. And on the other hand, the Indonesian law does not explicitly restrict access to contraceptive and general SRH services of, of, for individuals based on their age. However, there is a child protection law of 2002 uh, defined child as anyone under 18 years old, and it provides that parents and family members are responsible for maintaining the health of the child. This may suggest yeah, health, uh, health professionals need to consider uh, consult both children and parents when a decision is making about the medical testing or treatment. In the case of Indonesia, the law also prohibits the supply of contraceptive to unmarried men or women. In Malaysia, while the penal court uh, appears to be to imply that the children over the age of 12 may consent in the, independently, this, that, this is not made explicit. On the other hand, the CHAR Act in Malaysia in 2001 stated that parental consent is needed for patients under 18 years old for any medical treatment. Despite the age-based consent law that requires a minor to seek parent, parent consent with protectionist objective, the practical impact of such law may influence the delivery of services. Our study also found that healthcare providers reported that they have ever deny the underage youth access to SRH services due to the lack of parental consent. They also caution in addressing the SRH needs and requests from unmarried youth due to the fear of uh, repercussion from parents, communities, religious body, as well as the legal consequences. So the healthcare provider, the provision of I mean, despite some of the healthcare providers, they are willing to provide the SRH services, they also are uh, limited by the law. And on, uh, in addition to the law, 
domain in addition to medic uh, the the legal requirement for medical consent uh, for the minor dominant uh, social norms that restricting young people's sexuality are also reinforced by the law that regulates uh, regulate sexual acts sexual acts health behavior and sex relationship between young uh, for young people law that provide a minimum age which young people can lawfully have sex have a normalizing influence on the social taboo associated with youth sexuality, which can in turn influence the sexual health-seeking behavior of young people. In the Philippines, the age which girls and boys can legally consent to sex is 12 years old. However, in some defined circumstances, the law prohibits adult uh, age over 18 years old from engaging in the sexual acts with under 18 years old. In Malaysia, while most of the healthcare providers are aware that sexual intercourse with a girl under 16 years old, whether or not she given consent is considered statutory rape under the penal code. The, least, the recent enacted sexual offence against children, uh, children Bill 2017 has increased the age of sexual consent to 18 years old and it applied to both girls and boys and stating that any person who committed to both physical and non-physical sexual assaults with person under 18 years old is considered an offence. And the, this ad also stated that any person who are aware of such incidents and fail to uh, report the such cases is considered committed to an offence also. So if a healthcare provider, uh, die, I mean like uh, as a mean, uh, 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 young people under 18 years old and suspected she is engaging in the sexual activity, they are the, in the dilemma whether to report such case or not. Because Required by the sex, uh, as required by the sexual offence against the children bill in two zero seven, they have to report. And for Indonesia, Article two eight seven in the Indonesian Penal Code established the age of sexual consent for unmarried, uh, girl is fifteen years old. Uh, additionally, other than uh, whatever in the in the civil law, uh, the access of SRH services for unmarried youth, such as Muslim in the in Malaysia, are uh, also indirectly restricted by the Sharia law, as well as the social cultural norm that criminalize and stigmatize all sexual acts uh, be, uh, outside the marriage. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So, as such, the issue of sex, sexuality, and reproduction are still remain taboo in many South in many Southeast Asia countries, and the perceived stigma and embarrassment can lead to the reluctance to discuss and address this issue and restrict certain SRH services for young people who do not conform or social uh, to socially accepted norms and behavior such as unmarried youth, LGBTQI. The direct and indirect effect of the law and registration, which intersect with the social economy, uh, social, social cultural norms and religious belief, it will lead to the restriction of young people access to specific SRH services such as abortion and or requiring requiring third party uh, or such services such as parental or uh, spouse consent. And criminalization for certain group on uh for certain group, for certain group and uh or certain consensual sexual behavior is also uh, become a, what you call that a bigger a big impact. So the social, cultural, and legal barriers, which in turn it will result to put young people at risk uh, at poor SRH outcomes such as early and unintended pregnancy, unsafe abortion, sexual transmitted infection, and HIV. And also it create further economic bar economic barriers for individual to earning a livelihood. With which will further marginalize those from economically vulnerable groups. As a, our recommendation for the study, we are suggesting that relevant laws and regulations such as the legal age and medical consent to assess HRH services need to be reviewed to increase the availability and accessibility of the SRH services for youth. And we also think that age appropriate uh, comprehensive sexuality education beyond abstinence and uh, only need to be uh, beyond abstinence on, uh, need to be in place as per international guidance and related policies, plans and curriculum should be developed in order to protect and support uh, the provider, which is a teacher responsible for delivery of sexuality education.
and healthcare provider also need to be trained in uh to in a more sensitive way to address the SRH needs for the underage and unmarried youth by guaranteeing the uh, rights to, of you to access SRH services as well as the confidentiality of such services while trying to abide by the law and also social cultural norm. With that, I would like to say thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lim. I was just nodding away the whole time uh, for sharing your research on how SRH access is limited by various factors, including social norms and laws, and what do we need to do to understand the gap between the intersection of those factors, laws, social norms, in Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines. It really showed that there is a, a high demand on both uh, the use side, but also the supply side, and especially thank you for your recommendations that are really helpful leading a way forward. Um, with that, we actually finished all the presentations today and it is impossible for me to summarize everything, but I would like to thank first and foremost, the organizers for putting, such, putting together such a diverse program um, that really show that young people in the region experience a disproportionate burden of poor sexual reproductive health services and access, including high rates of early and unintended pregnancy, STIs, including HIV and violence. There is a substantial intersection, intersecting barriers that limit young people's access to essential information and services and that contribute to SRH risk and harmful practices. But it also showed that there are ways how, to, how we can engage young people um, how it is important to include, include young people in research and policies and programs and to learn from them firsthand. Um, we also learned today more about the different ways of engaging peers and make young people's voices heard. It doesn't necessarily have to go through the policy change, but it can also be through active sports and asking the right questions at the right point in time to be included in the conversation and the narrative. And young, enabling young people to achieve the highest attainable standards of SRH is also a fundamental human right reflected in international and regional agreements, which we all work towards. And um, this leaves me really with the assumption that all the presentations have in common that sexual reproductive health and rights in our regions need to be strengthened. Access to sexual reproductive health services need to be highlighted. And we really cannot do this alone. We really need to include young people in our conversations, our programs in the research. And the COVID-19 pandemic showed that even more. And with that, I'm happy to hand over to Shoba now to moderate the Q&A. We have received some questions so it's over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Heidi. And uh, we have the open uh, Q&A session now. Uh, and as Heidi has been telling you all, please uh, type in your questions or comments in the chat box and those watching on Facebook in the comments box. We already have a lot many questions uh, and we will, I'll take up as many as time permits. Uh, we have a question for our plenary speaker, Sue, uh, about is there enough data available on the needs of youth, including key populations in the Asia Pacific region. Are countries collecting segregated data? Because data is important. And maybe we would like the chairperson also to comment on that later on because she has been working on the importance of data and evidence. So Sue, would you like to answer that question? Uh, yes, uh, that is very, very uh, like, um, a valuable uh, questions uh, for, for me uh, individually and for our colleges who are working for young key populations in uh, across the uh, Asia Pacific. As you can see that through uh, our uh, representation, we found out so many issues, but rarely I can put the uh, numbers, I mean the percentage and, and, and such kind of information to uh, my presentations. Um, so it's a uh, it is a um, is the proof for a fact that we are now lacking a lot of information, lacking the evidence-based data for um, uh, to um, uh, for any many 
uh, issues for young uh, people uh, in our regions. And the problems come from, um, uh, I think that uh, is, is a quite general uh, problem happening uh, in our region because many uh, international fundings are withdrawing from our uh, many countries in our regions. And uh, so that's why the country, when they face the uh, finance uh, pressure, uh, they have to cut down so many uh, of uh, allocation for uh, researching specifically uh, to, uh, to focus on the young people issues. So many times uh, in country level and in regional level, we raise uh, uh, the problems of evidence-based data uh, for um, uh, to the stakeholder to help them have uh, to help them have the more how to say um, uh, um, uh, the, the clearer um, uh, view point of uh, view to uh, the issue that we raised, um, but uh, the the data is still um, like uh, not available for the stakeholder to see. It. So uh, it's also one of my um, uh, of, of my purpose when I create the presentation today that I really expect that all the stakeholders um, uh, and all of us can contribute more the data, um, uh, specifically um, the uh, stakeholder who holding the financial resources, we can invest more for the researchers and also the community to um, uh, dig deeper you know, from the community and uh, and find out uh, the evidence base to support to what uh, is uh, happening in reality in, in our community in Asia Pacific. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Haiti, would you like to add something to that, please? Thank you very much. Um, it's really important as the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals have showed us, how important data is to leave no one behind. And the current crisis, this is something that all presentations somehow showed, really highlighted that data collection should be shared as widely as possible so many people can benefit from it. And this is important that all stakeholders are involved because what we have seen during the crisis, during the pandemic, there were a lot of surveys uh, put out to ask young people about um, their feelings, about their perceptions, but it is really important to collect this data and bring them together to create a comprehensive and targeted approach. Over. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Min Swin, a program manager at PATH from Myanmar, and uh, Min wants to know uh, what roles do policy and plans play to stream youth SRHR in social and cultural beliefs of the region? And uh, how does the existing policy environment support youth SRHR? So uh, Dr. Lim, would you like to answer that question about the role of conducive laws? Hi, thanks for that question. Uh, I think as I show in my presentation earlier, uh, I mean like when I uh, speak in my presentation earlier, I think the approach uh, talking about like for young people access to uh, SRH services, the currently, especially in the Southeast Asia context, I would say that it's more from a protectionist uh, approach, which is like, will emphasize more for more of um, the abstinence and then require for uh, parental consent, which I would say that it's not really a very sub, uh, enabling environment, but it kind of like the way they develop the policy is from the protectionist approach, which will create more barriers for the young people uh, to access SRH services instead of like to empower the young people uh, 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 to make that decision on themselves and to make the informed, informed choices. I think we are still having a long way to go. Thank you. Uh, Nalini, would you like to uh, say something more on that, uh, particularly in the context of young girls? How does the existing policy environment support youth SRHR activities, especially sure. in the context of girls? Yes. Sure, sure. So I can speak a little bit to the Indian context. Yes, yes, I think yes, I would yes. uh, echo a lot of what Lim has said, because these are the very same issues that we're facing here. And for girls in particular, we see that gender norms really come into play very strongly because, uh, you know, even though when a sexual uh, SRH policy is relatively comprehensive, what we see is that there are gaps, particularly for unmarried adolescent girls and underage adolescent girls, and their SRH needs often get left out. 
and this is also very much linked to the social and cultural centrality of marriage as an institution, particularly for adolescent girls. So, uh, you know, the sexuality of adolescent boys is not so stigmatized in the way that a lot of gender norms and meanings are attached to sexuality of girls. And so when marriage is a central institution, then the policy also does not really recognize and legitimize sexual relationships happening outside of marriage. So that leaves a whole a huge gap in terms of PSRH issues of unmarried adolescent girls, which are not really issues. And they further exacerbated these issues uh, because girls can't really speak up to, uh, to anybody about them. There's a whole lot of stigma around them. So a lot of issues just, you know, progress, progressively get worse, uh, you know, under the surface. Okay. And we also see that a lot of times the policy focuses on issues like increasing birth interval or, you know, increasing the age at first birth for adolescent girls. But again, like, uh, you know, fellow panelists shared that it doesn't really have that empowerment approach, which is required to engage with adolescents, you know, give them the information that they need to make the choices for themselves to address the stigma around sexual and reproductive health. Uh, you know, policy around comprehensive sexuality education is very much lacking. Uh, and the policies also don't address uh, SRH needs of those who are in non-heterosexual relationships or for non-gender conforming individuals. And of course, young people's voices are also very much lacking uh, in contribution of uh, SRH policy making. That's all. Thank you. Uh, Nicole, we have uh, some questions for you. Uh, one question, uh, Gita from India wants to know why the name soccer? Uh, did the program interventions take place during soccer matches and activities? Uh, that's the first question, Nicole, yes? Yeah, that's a great question. So when grassroots soccer was originally founded, it was actually originally founded in Zimbabwe. We actually had professional soccer players who were our coaches working directly with young people to really address the HIV AIDS crisis. Um, I think, you know, GRS originally started as an HIV AIDS prevention and awareness organization and has, has shifted, you know, to sort of broader adolescent health um, since then. Um, yeah, so, so we do have activities that happen directly at soccer fields. And what we actually like to do is, you know, we're trying to level the playing field so that both boys and girls not only have equal access to sport and, and soccer in particular, you know, or football, as many of us call it, you know, which has historically been a boys sport. Um, so we're trying to level the playing field, both in terms of sort of athletic prowess, um, but also in terms of, you know, understanding around menstruation and contraception, etc. And so what we'll do is we'll host big football tournaments. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll host big football tournaments, you know, and uh, and at the actual site where the young people are, are, you know, playing sports, we will bring those service providers directly to the site. So people who are distributing bed nets, people who are distributing, uh, you know, contraception, doing HIV testing, um, you know, malaria testing, things like that, directly bring it to where young people normally congregate, which is typically around, you know, sporting fields and, and places where, where, where play is happening. Uh, thank you. Now, there, there is a comment that uh, linking sports with education is an amazing idea, connecting the dots. Uh, but what are your recommendations for countries where a lot of young people are not into institutionalized sports or in schools or within reach of sports programs, etc.? There are many schools. Um, we have many schools in India and maybe in other countries also where they, they don't even have a play field. Uh, they have computer labs, but they don't have play fields. So <laughs> technology is about so what is your uh, uh, right. You know, at the end of the day, kids are so resilient and so dynamic. They will just play anywhere. If there is a field, if there is somewhere, you know, where young people can run around, they, they will run around. They, you know, many of our programs, you know, especially in some of the rural areas where we work, we don't have proper football equipment. Like for cones, we just use rocks or shoes and they just dribble around, you know, the cones or they stuff plastic bags, you know, and make it very tight and turn that into a ball because they don't actually have, you know, a real soccer ball. So we try and keep our programs really dynamic, really versatile and flexible so that, you know, when, if young people don't actually have any formal or organized sporting activities happening, um, you know, they can still just get out and play. And that's really sort of woven into the nature of grassroots soccer's programs where, you know, you don't have to be on a sports team. You don't have to have any experience playing sport as all. We're you know, at all. We're really just trying to use play as a way to connect with young people in something that's fun and gets them excited, you know, and gets them motivated to talk about, you know, these more sensitive topics like gender-based violence and, and HIV, condom usage, you know, things like that. Um, and I think, you know, kids love to play. They love to bounce around. And so when we bring that high energy, they just get really excited, even if there's no formal sporting structure available. 
Okay, just one more suggestion. We have a climate change activist here, uh, Rahul, and uh, he wants to say that uh, oil companies are also part of climate problem caused by unabated use of fossil fuel. So, um, do you uh, have a plan to find other funding rather than from oil companies? Yes. So, in terms of Grassroots Soccer's um, international portfolio, the oil company funding only supports very specific countries where um, where that company is operating. So, Papua New Guinea happens to be one of the places where you know we're seeing a huge you know concerted uh, you know, corporate social responsibility effort coming from this company. But across Grassroots Soccer globally, you know we've got programs in Nigeria, Mozambique, Malawi, Dominican Republic, Ukraine, like just in. in in many different countries, US government, uh, by other government funding, high net worth individuals, we have other private sector stakeholders. So it's not just um, from the oil and gas industry, but in a couple places where there's you know, a really strong interest in corporate social responsibility, supporting communities around their, their plant sites, um, then we have that relationship. Okay, okay, uh, thank you. Uh, we have a question from uh, Nabrisa Murphy from Melbourne School of Population and Global Health. And Nabrisa wants to know young people's perception of what is the most crucial barrier to realizing their SRHR needs. What would they like to happen to overcome that barrier? And what role would they like to play in addressing this? So we have all the youth amongst our panelists today. Would anybody like to answer that question? What, what, what are the young people's perception of? Shekhat, what were your observations from the uh, conference which you organized? What would they like to happen to overcome the barriers? Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, this is uh, quite a good question because uh, we, uh, we at the conference, we, we receive uh, hundreds of young people from across the country and uh, many of them have very wild kind of questions. Uh, for example, uh, you know, like the married and unmarried debate, uh, you know, especially in terms of the SRH programs that are designed in, in the country context like Bangladesh, when all, almost every uh, program is designed for married adolescents. Well, the unmarried adolescents come up with a question like, why not me? Why not the services for me? Why don't you think that I need? I also need uh, education, or I also need uh, uh, services. But the government or the uh, program uh, implementation organizations they provide only the information to the adolescents who are not married. But then uh, they they also ask. But we also need services. And what if we need services? Where where do we go? We, do we go to Google? And is that what you support that we just go online and go to random websites and find any support that is available there? So, you know, this, this is uh, one of the debates that, uh, that are emerging at this moment in the, in the country, just because young people have uh, perceptions, different perceptions about uh, the programs that are implemented. Uh, and also they have their own sort of, you know, uh, logics. And which the, these are the logics that I think we need to explore. Uh, and also there are uh, uh, th there are new changes we need to adapt with, which is they need themselves in the uh, planning of the policies, in the you know designing of the programs. They don't want to be the participants. They want to be the decision makers. So this is very interesting type of perception. And we have heard uh, like, you know, like uh, hundreds of people, like they have been raising voices that when you design a program that is intending for uh, uh, us, we, we, we must be there. We must be on the board and give crucial advice and, you know, you know our, our sort of uh, uh, information that you need to, you know, capture or like uh, capture the design, uh, capture the program. So this is, I think, uh, uh, the question relates to the uh, correct uh, uh, correct point where what the young people mostly are thinking about. And uh, in many countries like Bangladesh, where young people, they are currently you know, learning new things. For example, the COVID situation. 
yeah last year we we organized like 350 plus young people they came together and had a very physical nice conference but this year we're going virtual so the difference if you see the difference the adaptability and how they will join that we need to find out and discuss with them that is what we're doing at this moment so is this for example a zoom is zoom compatible with them or do we do through google conference or any other platform so whatever that works for them whatever that doesn't work for us is not important it is it is important what is important you know what works for them what they are you know uh, compatible with so this is what we you know look at or need to look at and we must also consider from their lens not from the you know from top down it is a time to you know be a you know bottom up approach thank you thank you uh, we have a question from manish jha who is a senior reporter at the uh, sanmark daily newspaper from india and manish wants to know has uh, comprehensive sexuality education helped in meeting srh needs uh, many countries are still opposed to it including india and i'm sure bangladesh also uh, how much of it is needed and when from which class onwards and is there any data that how has it where it is uh, in force how has it helped in meeting the needs would would any of the panelists like to answer that uh, is there uh, shaykat is there uh, cse being you, uh, in bangladesh do you have comprehensive yes. sexuality education in yes, bangladesh thank you um, yes we we do have a very limited version of the uh, sexual education that i do not want to a term is comprehensive mm -hmm. because in order it to be a comprehensive sexual education it must uh, be uh, you know more friendly to the young people which is not because uh, uh, there are few chapters in the secondary school uh, textbooks but the teachers who are mostly feeling shy to open up those chapters and talk about them with the with the with their students but this this has really been a very you know long standing barrier over the last few years even bangladesh government has a policy to educate young people but in, in the in a religiously uh, you know restrictive environment where the you know they consider the schools are because the schools are managed locally and in many cases the lessons even they are in the textbooks may not be possible uh, in the in the local context just because of the schools and the management in in their in their area so um i think cse is really important but the point is if c you know how cse is entering a cultural context in this kind of kind of a country we need to also uh, structure cse in a way that it fits in into the culture it needs to uh, of course change some sort of norms of course change but <clears throat> in order it to be changed it sometimes need to be uh, you know adaptive and the you know as we know that in a, in a very restrictive environment they do, they simply reject csc how you how you inject something what is co completely rejected in many many contexts so in that cases uh, the first trial that bangladesh government has been trying is good uh, that the uh, chapter is included but it needs to be developed so what we have been doing at sirak is uh, we are advocating with the government especially the ministry of health and ministry of education to introduce the consent education because the initiation of a consent education is the basic is a foundation of comp comprehensive sexuality education that we believe because the children who are growing up they do not know that saying a no is a no a yes is a yes so the difference between a no and a yes is really uh, a mysterious term in some 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 spaces because in in a country where it is believed that a girls when a girl says no it means yes so you know this this is a confusion this is kind of a mission confusion kind of thing so i think the csc that currently is being implemented in the country uh, must have some other uh, components because it's not just seen as a sexuality education but it is a life long skill education because this is part of their life and you know this is how it must be looked at thank you thank you uh, heidi would you like to uh, share something 
or you have Thanks. made a very yes. important comment and also how is unfp helping uh, like in countries to uh, be more uh, responsive to this sort of an education mm -hmm. because many countries in south asia are still a little averse to as shaikat has mentioned that uh, yeah. they they say yes they want it but the the curriculum which is offered perhaps is not up to the mark or not uh, given properly yes please yes as shaikat pointed out um, cse comprehensive sexuality education is not only about sexuality education it is really about life skills about relationship about consent about body parts as well understanding the body and what unfpa also unesco always advocate advocates for is age appropriate cse and um, that we really look into curricula when when can we talk about what and those questions every young person has those questions is that it's better to be addressed openly in a very, in a safe space comprehensively than through for example social media where a lot of false information are spread as well so we have to be careful and find a good way of including it into curricula in schools but also looking into out of school cse and also cse that is safe and in a digital space more information can be found on unfpa site and also unesco has a comprehensive international guideline on comprehensive sexuality education that gives a really good one down on when to talk about what okay thank okay. you Yes. Uh, in fact, we have a comment from uh, uh, Kalpana Acharya from Nepal, and uh, she's a very senior journalist uh, on a TV. Uh, she runs a health online TV uh, in Nepal, and she says categorically that they think youth must be involved in SRH education from their school level. And as we are talking of what we say, age-appropriate uh, comprehensive education, uh, and what our other panelists are also saying. And uh, we have already overshot the time, but to end with, we are. For, uh, do, we are living in very difficult times. So, a question on COVID. We have a question from, uh, and I just wanted to mention that I think COVID is in India at least. In fact, we we had the highest number of new cases and highest number of deaths globally in the last 24 hours. So, it is striking us with greatly a great ferocity. Uh, Ghansham Pokhral from Nepal wants to know why are young people not serious about COVID-19? And uh, uh, I think what he means is, I find in India also that uh, when the lockdown was lifted partially, we, fee, we find a lot of people moving on the roads without wearing masks, without following any physical distancing, as if uh, they have a couldn't care less attitude. And uh, unfortunately, sorry to say, I find a lot many young people doing that. And we have news about young people partying and going out on social uh, activities just defying uh, what precautions they need to take. So um, what is uh, your take on it? Anyone who wants to answer that, what needs to be done? That youth are, it is not, it is about their SRH services also, but about other responsibilities as well. So um, would anybody like to comment on that? Would you like to comment? Hi. Yes, and short check up also. I'm just quickly uh, commenting because this is the third time I'm, I'm encountering the same question. Mm -hmm. And uh, every time my uh, answer was quite similar, which is uh, we wanted young people to be the frontiers in COVID response. Mm -hmm. And when we wanted them to be frontiers without a training, without any, any such a preparation to manage a pandemic, in their lifetime, they never seen a pandemic, right? They had never heard about something like this, maybe. And we, we have been asking them to be the frontiers and they are non-government people. They are not paid, they're mostly volunteers. And we have been uh, pushing them like almost every government that has a weaker health system that has asked young people to be frontier. Well, this is not a motivation to, you know, push people in the front to get killed. Sorry. So this is uh, exactly what we, we missed that young people were asked to be the frontiers. When they were asked to be the frontier, they got the feeling that we do not have, we, we have better immunity than many of many others. So we may not get COVID like that way, like the older people would get. So uh, I think these, the responsibility of young people's recklessness is uh, partially or more 
dependent on the how leaders responded to or how leaders asked them to go out or stay home or respond to the COVID situation. So this was like a, an information uh, that misled young people that they may have a better immunity uh, than others. I think this, this, this was one of the uh, uh, practical uh, situations that I observed. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Kalpana, would you like to say something? Kalpana Acharya and Ghanshyam Pokhral are there with us. So Kalpana, would you like to add something from your own personal experience in Nepal? If you want to speak, you can unmute yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Subhaji. Yes. Um, actually, uh, we all uh, are um, struggling with COVID-19 all over the world. So uh, youth must be aware, especially in this uh, situation, youth must be involved how to um, protect from the COVID-19 and these uh, consequences. We journalists must be aware and uh, our rules are important in uh, pandemic situation. So um, through the media also we can uh, raise and we can write uh, the, um, these consequences and uh, um, COVID-19 effect. So I just want to share this. Yes, yes, thank you very much. And I think Sherkat is right in saying that the messaging has to be correct. And I think somewhere down the line, we have failed in sending out the proper messages, which we find in, at least in some countries of uh, South Asia, at least we are finding that. Maybe Southeast Asia is uh, faring much better than that. Uh, well, we have already overshot the time by, I think, 20 minutes. So with this, with this, we come to the close of the first session of APCR SHR 10 virtual. And my sincere thanks to the chairperson, plenary speaker, abstract presenters, and of course, to the very, very vibrant audience. And once again, I extend my greetings to all the participants from India on this uh, festival day of Raksha Bandhan, which we are celebrating here today when sisters tie rakhis on the uh, hands of their wrists of their brothers and the brothers promise in turn to protect them. Well, let us promise to protect each other because I feel that there should no be no patriarchal sentiment in that and we should be protecting each other in these difficult times and later on also. So, and as youth, I think everyone should remember that it is about solidarity and not about masculinity. And it is only with solidarity that we'll be able to overcome and solve our problems. We will now meet on next Monday on 10th August at 12 noon Cambodia time for an International Youth Day special APCR SHR 10 virtual session on the theme of youth engagement for SRHR action in Asia Pacific. And by till then, stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shobha. Thank, thank you, Thank you to all the panelists. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. And the audience.